Hello everyone, my name is Terry Callaghan and I have the honour and privilege of having worked in the Arctic for 53 years in all the Arctic countries and I want to tell you a little, about, a little bit about the Arctic and how it's changing, why it's changing and why those changes are important to everyone in, on planet Earth. For part one of the talk I want to talk about where the Arctic is and what it's like there. Um, and that's mainly because many people have not been there. It's still a quite remote area and particularly some parts of it. Uh, and not very many people have a, a, a holistic, a, a complete understanding of the Arctic. So, as you know, it's in the north. It's not related to the Arctic Circle, which is a, a, an astronomical line, if you like, about the Earth's tilt. <clears throat> I like to think of the Arctic as defined environmentally by the limits of the big boreal evergreen forests um, and everything north of that, the Arctic tundra and the Arctic polar deserts are the true Arctic. It, at the North Pole is an ocean, not a landmass, and that ocean is covered by ice um, for most of the year, um, but the ice around the edges, around the landmasses, uh, melts each summer until September when it starts to grow again. There are eight countries in the Arctic, there is the vast Russian Arctic, which is the biggest landmass in the whole Arctic, going all the way from almost touching Alaska to uh, the Kola Peninsula on the borders of Finland. Then there's Finland, then there's Norway, this long country, and then there's Sweden along the Baltic coast there, uh, reaching beyond the Arctic Circle into the Arctic. Then there's Iceland and Greenland, the Canadian, the big Canadian Arctic, and last but not least is Alaska. What's it like there? Well, I, as I said, the, the, uh, the ocean there is covered by ice, so we have frozen seas. And this is just a, a, a fun photo that uh, so far people travel around on that ice. So you have pedestrians walking alongside ships in the Arctic. And that is changing, and I will tell you about how that's changing. There's also a lot of ice on land, particularly the ice that is formed by snow accumulation and the transformation of snow to ice. And of course, that flows down from the upper ice caps um, through valleys and, and form uh, valley glaciers. And those glaciers travel down to the, the sea, and uh, if they're very steep, then they have lots of crevasses, as you've seen here. When the glacier ice meets the water, of course the water is warmer than the ice, so the edge um, starts to melt and the ice breaks off and forms often very beautiful icebergs. On land there are a whole range of different environments in the Arctic. Uh, this one is a, a fun landscape, it's uh, very characteristic of many coastal regions of the Arctic landmass. Um, you see this patterning, it's called polygonal tundra because there are polygons everywhere and it's caused by something called permafrost and may, many of you may not be used to that term but permafrost is perennially frozen ground. The surface here is, is, is soil which thaws in the spring, remains um, un, uh, unfrozen in the summer and then freezes again in the winter. But if we go down, that, that level of soil is called, that horizon soil is called the active layer. But if we dig down deeper than that, maybe a metre in some places, maybe even just half a metre in some places, we hit a permanently frozen layer and that is called the permafrost. And that permafrost is responsible for all the patterning in this landscape. Underneath these areas of, of water in these margins, there will be ice lenses, which is permafrost. What is the vegetation and the animal life like in the Arctic? Well, here is um, a, a range of different types of vegetation. At the south, which perhaps is the limit of the Arctic, is the evergreen boreal forest. In Russia, that's called the taiga, T-A-I-G-A, -A, not T-I-G-E-R. And where the taiga meets the tundra, we have something called the tree line. Here you can see the tree line. We're looking from the tundra, looking south, into the boreal forest here and we have a couple of straggling trees. What's important about this tree line is this is caused by temperature very often um, without people being there it's caused by temperature 
And south of this line here in the background, we have high productivity, high biodiversity, a lot of species, and people live with their cities. North of that line, here in the Arctic tundra, everything is the opposite. We have very few people living, very few cities. We have uh, very low productivity and low biodiversity. When we travel uh, from this area at the tree line, we next meet the, the shrub tundra where we have willow and birch shrubs which le reach about one and a half meters high. And then gradually we go into the graminoid. Graminoids are rushes and sedges and, um, and grasses that, like the cotton grass here that uh, cover vast areas of the Arctic landscape. Turning to the animals, we have a, a whole range of uh, different animal types. We have the, the wolves, the moose, the Arctic fox, which changes colour to this white, beautiful white colour every winter, and uh, bears, and in this case it's the European brown bear. We also have reindeer, reindeer in uh, the, the old world Arctic, and caribou in the new world Arctic. The same species but different names. We have musk oxen, uh, a Pleistocene remnant and a remnant of the last ice age. A lot of voles and lemmings that, that have population peaks or used to have population peaks every five to seven years. And the snowy owl and many bird species. Uh, and the snowy owl is just one predator uh, of, of the small rodents like this one. As see, we have fairly simple food chains with uh, photosynthetic algae unicellular algae often associated with the ice edges or the underside of the ice that are capturing sunlight and the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide converting it into into structures that are used to feed fish and what eats the fish well we have the seals for example we also have a, the walrus the walrus doesn't particularly feed on fish but uh, feeds on uh, benthic organisms these are organisms that live at the bottom of the the sea on the sea floor like clams. And then we have a big predator, the biggest land predator in the world, the polar bear uh, that feeds on seals and walruses. But this is not the biggest predator, it's not the top of the food chain in the Arctic, the top of the food chain is us people. And the Arctic peoples that live along the coast um, use polar bears and everything else for food and for clothing, you see here this, this man is wearing polar bear uh, skin trousers. And all these peop people and all these animals depend on sea ice, uh, which is disappearing. So I mentioned people, so let's talk a little bit more about who lives in the Arctic. And there are a whole lot of different uh, races and different cultures in the Arctic, throughout the whole of the Arctic. So here are Greenlanders, Inuit Greenlanders um, from West Greenland. To the right here you see um, Khanti reindeer herders from the Yamal area of Russia and here are their reindeer. And these are reindeer in Finland belonging to Sami reindeer herders. But just have a little closer look at this picture here, which is quite important. These people, they use reindeer for pulling sledges for transport as well as snow scooters. You see a snow scooter in the background. You see their traditional clothing made of fur and textiles, but the lady is using a mobile phone. So these people are suffering from climate change, which is changing their lives, but at the same time that they're experiencing globalization, um, which means that they have to become accustomed to modern ways of life and new ways of living but still living to some extent in traditional ways too. If you're a child in the, uh, living in the Arctic, then you have to learn skills which children in our country do not. They spend a lot less time on screens and on um, uh, computer games. They spend far more time learning traditional skills like lassoing reindeer antlers, so that when they're older, they can pull out reindeer from the herd to mark them to see who they belong to. 
And here is a family of Nenets reindeer herders from Siberia. You can see on this little map that they come from right in the middle of the Siberian coastline here in Yamal. And they are leading on the whole a very traditional life with they, they don't um, herd reindeer to, to kill that they use mainly the reindeer to pull their sledges and for other things and they hunt um, reindeer for food. How do they live and uh, what are their homes like? Well this is a very modern settlement I mean the settlement's been there for a long time but the houses are modern uh, in West Greenland and you can see that uh, there is not very much growing here. Um, it would be very difficult to have a game of football for example. So these people live entirely off the sea, fishing and hunting whales and seals. This is another Greenlander village uh, from further north, a little bit more vegetation, but nothing to eat because it's too, too cold to grow food plants there. And again, this community uh, depends totally on the sea. And here's an example of one particular house, a very successful hunter's house, and here are the polar bear skins, the musk oxen skin, and there will be seal skins here as well, and the fishing nets. So families like this depend totally for their food and their, um, their clothing on what they hunt and catch. So they don't hunt for fun. They hunt because they have to survive off, off what they hunt. A diff completely different type of house. There are many people living in the Arctic who um, are not Arctic indigenous peoples, but work there um, to, to uh, make money or um, to, uh, some people don't just work there to make money. There are also Arctic inhabitants who have been there for a thousand years. Those are people of Iceland, the Faroe Islands, for example, um, who were, were, were there because the Vikings colonized those areas a thousand years ago. But houses like this are used by what we call shift workers who are people from the south of Siberia who go to the north to work in the mines uh, for a few months and then go home. But this is the situation that they live in when they're in the Arctic in the winter. Now then, part two, after giving you some ideas of who lives in the Arctic, what it's like there, this next part is about how the Arctic is changing. And that's one of the major thrusts of the talk. I think we all know about global warming, but perhaps what you don't know is that the Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else on Earth. And we talk about Arctic amplification, Arctic uh, amplification of global warming. And there's a common figure that the Arctic is warming fast, as, twice as fast as the rest of the world. But in some places, it's more than twice as fast. And this year, you might have seen in the news that in this place in Verkohansk in Siberia, there was an extreme warming event we reached 38 degrees Celsius on June the 20th. And that is hot. That is extremely hot for Britain, let alone the middle of the Arctic. And what we're seeing in the Arctic is many more events, extreme weather events. So extremely hot events in the summer and very warm events in the winter when the snow disappears. But what happens after these extreme events? Why are they important? Well, here are three examples. We start with the middle one. There's very often now, there is an event in the winter when it gets warm, warm air comes into the area, then the snow melts, and then it gets cold. And when the, the, thaw, the melt water from the snow gets cold, of course, it freezes again. So then there's an ice layer on the ground instead of snow. That means that the animals that depend on the snow for to get through the snow for food, like the reindeer, can't do that and they die. So these are dead reindeer. In one event in 2013, 40,000 reindeer died in one area because they starved to get death because of an extreme event created ice which the reindeer couldn't dig through. Of course, not just the animals die, but the vegetation dies too quite often. So these are dead uh, shrubs in the north of Norway, all killed by a few warm days in the middle of winter when there should have been snow everywhere. And then, of course, when you get dead vegetation and you get dead trees as well, then the incidence of fire increases dramatically. So we're seeing far more fires in the boreal forest and the taiga as a result of these extreme events. What is this photograph here? Well, this is something quite worrying. 
when we have fires, it affects air quality because of the smoke. This smoke is traveling over 1,000 kilometers. And this is a photo taken at midday of the sun in a town in Siberia, which was 1,200 kilometers away from the fire. And this is the smoke that they could see. And of course, this affects um, people who have breathing difficulties and the air quality is really poor. Now let's turn to permafrost. I introduced permafrost to you, but permafrost is thawing too. This is what happens when permafrost thaws and it, the permafrost is rich in ice. The ice melts and the water from that ice flows away and the, the surface subsides. What happens when the surface subsides is the trees fall down. In fact, the forests in these areas are called drunken forests because they're falling over. Not only that, if you build in these areas, then houses fall down, roads break up, oil pipelines break, airstrips break. So there are big logistical problems as well as natural problems arising from permafrost thawing. Recently, there has been a new phenomenon discovered, which is that the thawing permafrost sometimes creates pressure of gas underneath the surface that can't escape. And then suddenly pressure is so great that everything above the, that uh, permafrost layer uh, is ex exploded and sent up into the atmosphere and um, lands round about, uh, creating small ponds. But in the center where the explosion occurred, there is a big crater. You can see the person here in the boat to give you some idea of the scale of this, this phenomenon. And here are people climbing down into the crater to sample for the methane gas that originally caused the explosion. Snow is also changing and it's changing in a little bit of a complicated way that the duration of snow is decreasing dramatically. So the winter snow cover is reduced in, in timing. The spring comes earlier and the autumn comes later. But in the middle of winter, we can have far deeper snow. I hear some examples of deep snow. This is uh, in a city called Tomsk in Siberia. And this is what you have to do in the morning when you want to go to work, remove one meter of snow. This you've seen before, but here is now a reindeer um, getting food from underneath the snow. The reindeer has to dig through all this snow to get to the lichens and the shoots that it eats below. Now, this is a good example of where a reindeer is happy because there is not an ice layer in this area, it can actually eat. If there had been a, a, a winter warming event, this, this vegetation would have been embedded in ice and the reindeer would not have been able to eat. Ice is also changing on the ocean, on the Arctic Ocean too, and you have to understand the dynamics to understand what is going on here. So this is an ocean where around the North Pole there is uh, permanent ice, but as we go into spring, the periphery, the edge of that ice starts to melt and the ice sheet gets smaller and smaller until September. And in September, of course, we, we're starting to get into winter, the temperatures are low, so then the ice starts to grow again. But if we look from satellites at the extent of the ice in September, we, we are at the minimum ice extent. And we can compare that over time. So this is 1984, this is 2016. And we see that we are losing a huge amount of sea ice. This area of ice that has disappeared is something like 3 million square kilometers, a very big area. I'll tell you later about why that is important in terms of our climate, but it's obviously important for those animals like the walrus, seals, polar bears, that need an ice surface to breed on and to feed from. For people, it's also important that in the past, it's been impossible to sail around the Arctic um, with transport routes from, from, for example, Europe to Japan, uh, because the passages have been closed by ice touching the land. Here you can see ice, which prevents any ship from getting through to the Northwest Passage. But now that's all changed. And we have gas tankers going from the middle of Siberia all the way to Korea along this Arctic coastline. We can now get tour ships 
and container ships through the Northwest Passage. What is happening to vegetation? Well, the tundra is changing in some areas due to trees and shrubs pushing into formerly very big open tundra areas that are important for reindeer, uh, herding by local people. And these areas, these big open areas, are homes to millions of birds that migrate from Europe and elsewhere. But these open areas are now becoming closed, at least at the south, as these trees and uh, shrubs move in. This, in the past, it has been the, the cold, low temperatures that have uh, prevented trees from and shrubs from establishing. This is a, a thermal image of a tree uh, in the Arctic. The temperatures are very low around, but the trees, sorry, the shrubs and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the ground plants are protected by snow underneath these cold surface temperatures. The tree is not protected by snow, it's above the snow. So you see now this tree is experiencing temperatures of minus 15 or, or more. Of course, as the temperatures increase due, due to global warming, then more of these trees are warmer and, uh, and can, can survive. You see here some of these trees that are pushing into formerly open meadows. And it's a problem for the reindeer herders uh, for two reasons. One is that predators like bears and wolves can hide and they find it much easier to attack the reindeer. And the other is that the reindeer get lost and evade uh, being herded by the reindeer herders. And it's not just the trees and the shrubs that are moving north in many places. Animals and even harmful diseases are moving north as well. So this is the, the, the Arctic fox, an iconic animal um, from the Arctic. It changes its color every winter, a beautiful animal. But now we are seeing red foxes move into the territories of Arctic foxes. And red foxes in many places are displacing these Arctic foxes. We also see a newcomer here, which is the magpie. In this particular area of Siberia, the magpie has moved in as well. Why are these animals moving in? Well, it's a combination of various things, but one important aspect is these are scavengers and they live on the dead reindeer that were killed by the icing events that are caused by warm winter events in winter. So a few days in winter that kill reindeer can cause a sudden change in biodiversity, a sudden change in the types of animal that can live there. Part three, a different type of story now. If the Arctic is changing, we've heard that. So how are we causing those changes? How are we affecting the Arctic? Here are immediately two examples. The, this is pollution, uh, plastics that are pr produced outside the Arctic are traveling to the Arctic and on the beaches in the Arctic there is a, a concentration of plastics as high as we can find in European beaches as well. So it's a really high uh, percentage of harmful plastics that are getting there from outside. We also have a lot of exploitation of resources in the Arctic. There are many resources in the Arctic, gold, diamonds, and fossil fuels, gas and oil. And this is what happens in many areas of the Arctic tundra in, in Russia, where we have uh, gas plants, um, just uh, bottling gas and, and putting gas into pipelines and sending it as far away as China. And of course, it's not just that we have the local pollution here and the local disturbance to the tundra, but all that gas that is coming out of the ground underneath this insulation is going to areas further south outside the Arctic, which is being burnt to provide energy, and that is providing the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide that's polluting our atmosphere and creating global warming. There's also pollution of snow and ice. And this is a, a frightening picture. This is what Manchester used to look like when I was a child. I used to have to go to school uh, through atmospheres like this that killed many people. Fortunately, we don't have such severe pollution now. But if you look at this graphic, which, and I hope you can see the map in the background, this is Europe, here's Britain, and here's Scandinavia. Every one of these dots is a dirty industry. And it's not just in Eastern Europe. You can see them 
also in uh, mainland Europe too, even in uh, northern uh, northern Spain. So there are problems, and what happens to the pollution? For example, we call it black carbon. This is soot. Um, this pollution is taken by atmospheric currents uh, way up into the Arctic. So all these colours are the pollutants coming from these factories that are reaching Spitsbergen or Svalbard, Arctic Norway, Arctic Finland, and even getting as far as northeast Greenland at about 80 degrees north. So what happens here is getting all the way up here. Another change in the Arctic that uh, is caused by what we're doing to our atmosphere is that we are experiencing rising sea levels. So in the Arctic, we have a lot of um, ice formed by snow on land. This is not ice at sea. This is not sea ice. This is snow falling on land, uh, for falling ice that then comes down to the sea. And here you can see a glacier, what it was like in 1941 and what it's like now or some years ago it's even worse now but all this ice here even though it's now sea all that ice is not sea ice it's ice that came down off the mountains when that melts as it has done obviously here that creates um, a, a new water input to the sea and of course that creates sea level rise everywhere and on top of even big areas like the Greenland ice sheet we have rivers which are torrents waterfalls that is just pouring water off the land into the sea and increasing our sea level. We, ex we, we see here that we're already ex uh, expecting a 0.21 metre from, icy, from Arctic glaciers and if the whole of this ice sheet melted that would increase um, sea level by 7.2 metres. That won't happen for many hundreds of years but this is what we see now that we would expect with a one metre sea level rise. This is Bangladesh and you see the land that will be lost in Bangladesh and in India uh, due to a one metre sea level rise that we expect in 100 years time. And it's not just along the coast, although the coast is the most vulnerable. If you look, it's along these low lying rivers, far inland along the river banks. And we estimate that about 140 million people will be affected by sea level rise in this, this century. That was one example of how the changing Arctic affects us. But there are other examples too. And one of these is uh, the important effect of albedo. Now albedo it may be a term you haven't heard about, but albedo is the reflectivity of the surface. It's how shiny the surface is. Why is that important? Well, the Arctic has been a shiny surface for 100,000 years or more. What that means is that it's cooled planet Earth it's bounced warming radiation back into the atmosphere and resulting in a cooler climate. So just as in this graphic where you have snow, you have reflection back into space. And here you see reflection um, from this, in this case from sea ice, but it's the same from the snow as well. And you have something like from the snow surface, a clean snow surface, 80% of the radiation um, passed back into, into space. So the land is cool. But where the boreal forest, the tiger, starts to move into the tundra, instead of the surface reflecting 80% of the radiation, it can, reflect, it can absorb 80% of the radiation. So that makes the whole area uh, much warmer. And then remember the pollutants? This is ice in Greenland, black ice. And some of this is local dust and pollutants. Some of it is black carbon, soot from our dirty industries. And here is the sea ice with open areas of water. The sea ice is reflecting radiation, but the open areas due to warming is capturing radiation and warming up. We call this effect a, a feedback, and this is what we call a positive feedback. So just imagine this, we, we have snow that is reflecting radiation, but then we have less snow, open areas like this, because of climate warming, because of our greenhouse gases, and these areas absorb less, uh, absorb more radiation, reflect less, so this area becomes warmer. So our atmosphere becomes warmer, so more snow melts. And as more snow melts, 
then we get more bare areas and more vegetation change and more heat absorbed. So this is what we call a positive feedback loop. We go round and round, getting warmer and warmer and warmer. These impurities in the snow that come from southern industry and also from forest fires um, help snow microorganisms um, to become established and to grow. So we're all used to beautiful areas of snow like these, but in fact, in many areas, the snow is not pure and white like this. It can be different colors due to the microbes that are living there because it's getting warmer and there's more moisture on the snow surface, but also because there's more uh, pollution, which are providing nutrients for the microbes to grow. The Arctic affects us also through greenhouse gas emissions. We are releasing greenhouse gases where we live in the south, but the Arctic has captured greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere naturally and has stored them very, very safely for 100,000 years or more. So because decomposition is slower than photosynthesis, the carbon that comes out of the atmosphere into these green photosynthetic trees and vegetation isn't released efficiently back into the atmosphere because the microorganisms in the soils that break down the dead plant material are working very slowly because of permafrost and because the soils are so cold. So that means we have vast stores of carbon both on land and under the sea and this carbon um, is very safely stored or has been until now. In these permafrost areas we have carbon stored which is equivalent to twice the amount of carbon we have in our atmosphere, in the whole world's atmosphere. And so you can understand why we're very worried if this carbon starts to get released to the atmosphere. And it is. Now then, if the carbon is released by microbes working here in the, the land areas, then they respire carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, of course. If that carbon is respired from wetland areas, like these, these ponds created by thawing permafrost, then that gas, those microorganisms are releasing the greenhouse gas methane, which is about 30 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And in areas like this, there's so much methane being generated by these ponds that in winter time, when the methane is trapped by ice, if we break through the ice, we can actually set the methane on fire. This is an estimate of just, an illustration of just how uh, incredibly important these greenhouse gas emissions are from the Arctic. And now we are measuring in many places uh, these greenhouse gases, both uh, uh, carbon dioxide, methane and other gases as well. There is another aspect that you very rarely hear about as an impact of climate change in the Arctic on us. And that is geopolitics. This is the politics related to the Earth. And there is some good news and some bad news. We know that during wars, there are lots of migrants. We've seen this, unfortunately, very sadly, over the past uh, 10 years or so uh, in places like Syria. These are people leaving their home for, bad, for, for reasons of conflict and war. But when we have climate warming, about 140 million people will suffer from sea level rise and will lose their homes and their agricultural lands and will have to move. So we will have climate migrants and we have to plan ahead for those. Fortunately, we have good collaboration in the Arctic. Here you see an exercise of Coast Guard vessels which are used to rescue uh, ships in trouble in the Arctic Oceans and uh, in, the, in the Atlantic and they work together and we have a, something called the Arctic Council, the foreign ministers of all the Arctic, all the eight Arctic countries who work together and together with the indigenous peoples. So we have good collaboration in the Arctic but we have to remember that geopolitics is operating in the Arctic and we have to work together. What can we do better? Well, we can travel less using petrol and diesel. And also what we don't often think about is we should move products around far less than we do now. This is a bottle of water. 
This bottle of water was produced in France and it was bought in Svalbard or Spitsbergen in the high Arctic. And in this area, we have unlimited water, which is some of the purest in the world. Why do we need to transport water around the world when we have water around the world in many places? We need to waste less food. And it's not just about wasting less food, but it's everything we use, everything we do, all the products we use. We should use them more efficiently because when, we, when those products are made, they use fossil fuels, they use resources and we should use those resources much more economically. We should find alternatives to plastics. I showed you plastics on an Arctic beach, but of course plastics in other parts of the world has a much bigger impact on the animals there, like this turtle. This is a six pack, um, just thrown away into the sea, that's now creating misery for this turtle. We need to recycle more. We need to protect our green areas. We need to destroy far less of our forests and our green lands. And we need to build upwards, not outwards. We need to protect green areas and we need to plant more green areas and more trees to absorb the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. And as I mentioned, we work, need to work together. We need to collaborate with other people here where we live, but also abroad, around the world. Everyone will suffer from climate change in some way. And we all need to work together to try to uh, improve the situation. And just my little slide here, this is the very first IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that met near London in 1988-89. And this was the start of all the action on climate change and all the measurements of climate change and assessment. And although here you see my white hair, here you see I had dark hair when I was at this very first meeting. Finally, moving forward together, we have to move forward together. If we have a vision statement for the Arctic, we need a world where Arctic ice and snow no longer melt as a result of human activity. And remember, this is human activity outside the Arctic that's causing the Arctic snow and ice to melt there now. It's not fair. If we want a pledge for all of us to, to take, then that play, pledge could be to take at least two small actions to reduce our impact on the planet every week until at, at least the next COP26 meeting. Of course, we want to talk to our leaders, our decision makers, and I do that. I, I talk to governments. And one of our messages is that they should set more ambitious climate targets by understanding that a global warming limit of 1.5 degrees is not enough for the world, but is totally relevant for the Arctic, which is already warming far, far faster than that 1.5 degrees. I want to thank you all for your attention and thank the people who provided all the photos, all the information. And there are some photos that I could not credit, but I thank those people anonymously anyway. And I wish you good luck. This world is a beautiful world. It's your world, not mine. And uh, I, I think your generation will be much cleverer than mine and much more environmentally friendly. But do what you can to protect this precious place and particularly the Arctic. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>